<laughs> Folks, welcome aboard. It's Tuesday night. You know what that means. Murder Hobo Inc. live with Between the Rolls, our Stab at a Talk show. We'll see how this one goes. Uh, you know, eh, maybe good, maybe bad. Maybe you should go watch a rerun of Family Guy or something. Now, follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive. If you want to buy cool stuff, uh, it's down below. If you want to join us on Discord, it's down below. Most importantly, if, like Joe, you want to join us on the talk show or on a one-shot, M Hobo Inc., Twitter or Gmail, hit us up. Let us know. We'll get you pushed in there. Uh, I mentioned Joe. Joe's new, so Joe gets to go last because, you know, He'll let these guys make a fool out of themselves. Exactly. Uh, first <laughs> fool up is David. David, tell us a little oh, bit about yourself. Oh, crap. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Hi, I'm David, and uh, I am usually um, on the Thursday night show, uh, Cacophony. I am predominantly here lately. I have been on uh, Between the Rolls. And because we like you. Every once in a while, mm. I'll get a one shot on Saturday. So I was <laughs> in it last week. So check it out in our archives. So anyway, that's me in a nutshell. And a baby. Push mm -hmm. that archive crap. Uh, next up's Carol. Carol, same question, different answer. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Carol. I'm a commission mini painter, a longtime gamer, and sometime GM. Uh, and I'm on the campaign. And I show up in some of the one shots uh, and I'm on this. It seems like all the time, but that's because my normal Tuesday night game on hiatus till COVID is gone. Fuck COVID. You know, you make me feel <laughs> special when you say it that way. It's yeah, like, I've got to say. nothing else other than maybe a burst. Of but, bite, okay. but I'll be here. That's that's right. No, I'm kidding. I really like doing this show. <laughs> And that brings us to our newest guest, Joe. Joe, who are you? And tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, hey, I'm Joe, Joe the DM. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Joe the DM. J-O, there's no E in that. Uh, I also have a website, JoeTheDM.com. I'm a professional dungeon master. I run one-shots, weekly campaigns, bi-weekly campaigns, and occasionally the monthly campaign. Uh, at the moment, I have uh, five ongoing games that are in a homebrew world of my own design, uh, sandbox adventure style. Uh, I have been playing RPGs since I was like, well, 13. Um, so How I have old a lot are of, you? I'm, I'm <laughs> 30. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm now, I'm past the 20s now, so I'm old. Uh, that's how thanks, thanks, Joe. Way to get thanks, me to Joe. early. <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we're all, we're, I mean, I would have been 80 since I was 13, so. <laughs> so nice. Uh, and that, that's me. I, I'm uh, happy to uh, pop in, talk d and I love talking tabletop RPGs. And when I get a chance to play, I love to play Warlock. Nice, nice. Without, uh, without Eldritch Blast. With the oh wow, what is, that what is, is interesting. This creature, wow. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm said, gonna, I'm intrigued. I'm gonna have to watch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joe, you said you had five campaigns. Do you yeah, have you, room for more? Uh, okay, uh, yes, for bi-weekly for sure. Uh, adding another weekly game might not be uh, in the docket at the moment, but alternating. Uh, currently, I have since I have Sundays free and uh, Thursdays, but. Most things are up for uh, discussion, and I love the idea of running daytime games. If people have uh, afternoon slots open, that's where a lot of my free time is at the moment. There you go, folks. You can contact Joe. Uh, we left his Twitter underneath his name. Uh, give him a shout or check out his website. Uh, see what he can do for you. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and thank Pirate Dog Dice that uh, create dice that roll a little bit too high for my players, which pisses me <laughs> off. And of course, Odd Fish Games, oddfishgames.com. Uh, if your game stinks, go get some of their adventure scents and make it smell purdy. Uh, they had uh, how to RPG with your cat this past weekend. If you missed it, uh, hopefully they'll be doing it again. I'll let you know if they do. Oddfishgames.com. Uh, folks, tonight we're going to discuss lore. But first, as you know, if you've seen this show before, we got to do a recap on how freaking awesome uh, the games I ran last week. Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and start uh, Odd David, Even Carol. 
No, just no, let David do. Let David. David it's always- a one. Thank you. You want to let me run the show or are you going to run the show? <laughs> <laughs> you're on deck. Congratulations. Hey, hey, yeah, you're secondary uh, DM here there, hon. No, I'm in charge. <laughs> Take my name out of the hat, really. Uh, David, David. Uh, you and Carol, uh, along with a new player, and <coughs> excuse me, and Kyle, uh, were part of episode 146, Delivery into Danger. How bad did I screw it up? Very badly. <laughs> no. <laughs> that happens. No, it was, it, was, it was awesome. Oh, my God. I just can't believe the shit that happened carol do you want to tell him <laughs> oh i'm terrible I'm ter- what the fuck happened that oh day? okay wow, then. basically you. warming no. the cockles of my heart guys oh, what <laughs> happened oh it was a great game don't know what happened we had a show some shit happened check it out in the archives there we go. peace <laughs> no, i'm kidding uh we we had we had our one shot and uh it, it was amazing. Basically, we were tasked. We were given the task to make a delivery uh, to the front lines in a war zone, which has nothing to do with saving Private Ryan. Not a thing. Uh, no. To, no remote to this motive. to this sweet old lady, Granny Smith, her mm. her son. You know, on the front station, on the front line. Uh, uh, so, Tommy, right? What's that? The guy on the front line was Tommy Smith, right? Tommy yeah, Smith. Should have been yep. Steve. But should have been Steve. Him. Yep. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, as a gift for us to start our journey, she gifted us with battle locks. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I'll get to it in a moment, folks. <laughs> but basically, we had a series of misadventures and encounters uh, where our battle ox- oxen kept taking a beating and there was no, no, one no, no, in, no. Pati- in particular Kyle's. Hmm? Kyle's kept taking a beating exactly. my heated me and kept throwing rainia off but kyle that just too <laughs> friggin almost died like 20 times yeah myself Jesus. carol and kyle played along with the new guy travis uh travis was a great player he played a cleric you know a chill cleric no he played a druid Druid, that's it. Druid. Yeah, it was he a was Goliath Druid. Druid. Oh, awesome. yeah, a Goliath Druid, wonderful. but but <laughs> super chill. <laughs> that was his thing. Great. So anyway, uh, yeah, just hilarity ensued. Uh, Carol kept getting thrown off her mount. <laughs> yeah, couldn't friggin' make a roll. Kyle's <laughs> Kyle's <laughs> mount kept near, almost near death. No, didn't actually die, but was always near death <laughs> during each encounter. And uh, with Kyle playing his uh, surgeon barber, we always managed to pull, and the oxen's name was Dewey, back from the jaws of death. So anyway, he gave him and Sweeney it. Todd is what he, he played. Put, Todd and yes. he put freaking right. leeches on the thing or maggots yeah. or I'm surprised he didn't maggots kill. leeches for some yeah. reason that was his thing that restored healing. Anyway, it <laughs> um, works. We had a, we ran into a prospector who uh, wanted to purchase <laughs> Rainia, which we were gladly, even me being a paladin, wasn't going to step in to deny, <laughs> deny the man his request. I doubt one of the party members. And Rainia, Rainia's catchphrase is she'll try anything once. Yeah, folks, she ended up trying it once. So. <laughs> yeah, because he gave her chocolate covered cockroaches. Which it's actually delicacy worked. Out there. They were very made to check. They were good, and his performance role was good. So, yeah. you know, there I you thought go. He, that, hey, he was great. I mean, geez, I think he was probably better than me. And Rainy is probably really good at this at this point. Well, <laughs> after after that, thing. folks, we we had our big uh, encounter with the Frakimoth. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> that didn't go well dewey once again ended up on the on the brink of death but kyle pulled it back so (laughs) so to rushing towards our finale uh kyle decided within 15 minutes of the game to murder hobo so basically what he did was take the package which was potion of heroism uh 
give it to the oxen, Dewey, and take his leech water, pour it into the no. pour it into the potion bottle, and we presented it to Private Smith, who in Probably turn died of throat leeches. Yeah, had, had the placebo no, I... effect of heroism. Told yeah. his troops to lead him into battle, and unfortunately, he did not survive. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our episode, folks. Oh, glorious. Except in a bad of overconfidence, thinking that was a potion of heroism. Hey. Which was the implication. Fantastic. You know, Joe was thinking about joining you guys for a one shot. And yeah. I don't think you're going to sell. Gotta be, gotta be alert, sell. Joe. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm always on the ball. Uh, but uh, 9 45, you better be. Yeah, just keep an eye <laughs> on that clock at 9 45. Just like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carol, what he miss? It's a mistake. It was a total mistake. We never should have. We should have given it to Travis. Or I can't remember the character's name. It was uh, Ty, I think. You know, and I really think we missed out on not calling him Mongo from Blazing Saddles. And that's the he's other a thing. Goliath on a friggin' oxen. Oxen, exactly. We totally I, I missed, missed the missed opportunity. Oh. We missed it. But uh, Travis was a great player. His druid was awesome. Sorry, I called him a cleric, but you know he did some healing. But you know, mostly shifted into a bear and kicked ass. So. Yes. Yeah. Him oh, he murder hoboed us too. Oh yes, my he god, he was the he he committed the first murder hobo of that night. And when we say murder hobo, yeah. it doesn't always in, entail murdering. <laughs> so it just Usually. just means just being a really bad player so just, just being being mean to the to the world mm -hmm. yeah. oh yeah me 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 player so yeah but the the chest mm -hmm. yeah I with him in feral oh uh, direwolf form form decides to mark the chest with the magic scrolls or no it was battle plans on the inside of it and just ruined the, the battle plans to where Arched they were launched oh no yes. oh yeah yes. <laughs> we got oh, us man. Man. <laughs> it was just like kudos man right out to shoot. it's just, just like great. you're one of us now <laughs> yeah exactly just fuck with it all can i say that, that, that fuck? yeah that, I knew he just, is right. Okay. We're like George Carlin on here some nights. All right, some wonderful. nights, yeah, depending on who's playing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the warning's already gone out. If Folks at home, if you missed the warning, it's for mature audiences. And, uh, you know, if you're a kid, you should probably ask your parents. But no, you don't have to ask them. <laughs> it's we're, Twitch. We're talking nerdy oh, what kid asks his parents for permission? Your kid, don't. It's Twitch. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not telling him to sign up as being older than he is because, you know, there's yeah, no yeah. safeguard. Not saying that. Okay, Carol, what did uh, what did David miss? I think he could, I think between the two of us, I tried to pick up the stuff that he missed. Um, anything else that he missed, honestly, just watch it. He got all the good points, anyways. Uh, but yeah, anything else he missed, watch the watch in the archives. There you go, uh, Joe. You mentioned that you had uh, caught a couple snippets. Did you happen to see any of that game? And if so, what were your musings on it? Oh man, uh, I I <laughs> uh, that I did I did not catch those moments in particular. Those all sound brilliant. Uh, I I love I love that you guys have like that you're murder hobo incorporated and that you have a like a murder a murder hobo this as a moniker of something that happens that your players do. That's mm -hmm. that in itself is is great. Sometimes no. they're unintentional. <laughs> so, but, no. Unless Kyle's playing, and then they're always intentional. Intentional. Or Caitlin, yeah. our youngest murderer. <laughs> she will kill you. She, she will, will kill just you. Flat out kill your ass. Her first right. game, 30 seconds. She, right, into she, it. right into Stabbing it. Stabbing people. Killed three people. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's dangerous. <laughs> That's like, shit. And you I can catch it. her on Thursdays in Cacophony, uh, where so she. Well, right? where uh, Carrie and David have managed to at least slightly get her calmed down and not kill everybody in town. <laughs> uh, every once in a while, it still happens. Yeah. Uh, next game up was episode 147, Nizumi Ruins, our campaign on Sunday featuring three <laughs> generations, uh, grandpa, sons, and grandsons, and a family friend. Uh, these guys are 
hobbing their way through the jungle of the Tabaxi to find the total, total ruins of Nizumi, which they found last time with the help of Phineas Latrec, gnome pain in the ass. Uh, if he lives through the Nizumi ruins, I will be shocked because I'll <laughs> kill that guy. Uh, this weekend, they had a good time. They were down one. Haggis Crapstain could not make it, so we were playing four players. Uh, and they seem to jettison themselves into the Temple of the Serpent, a.k.a. Home of the Bone Naga. Uh, one quick bestow curse managed to get rid of two of them. <laughs> uh, they had their troubles, and again, they saw the ebony dragon fly over and save them from a flaming basilisk that they managed to catch on fire in another building uh despite their bumbling they have made significant process progress in the home of dumbassery magic items that i've been uh imparting upon them sadly <laughs> they are starting to realize that not all magic is good or useful uh if you want to catch that that's also in the archives it's still on twitch for the time being but it is in the archives tinyurl.com m hobo inc archive catch them uh this week we got uh, three games most likely we've got thursday and cacophony saturday is the campaign let's see what the jailbirds are doing and sunday i think they might get done with the nizumi ruins because i think that dragon's going to keep them at bay if that is indeed what it is nobody's really made that clear uh, but then were, someone arrest them and send them to jail so they can be like the rest of you. They, they got they got to get back to El Torain, uh, the the home base of the Tabaxi. Hey, uh, there was a chance he was not going to throw my group into jail, but Caitlin decided to wear the evidence when we walked right into. Oh God. And you guys walked right into jail. Here's my weapons. Let me go interview somebody. <laughs> Clink. Way to go, dumbasses. <laughs> Oh my my job is easy. So we got two groups in the can. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll see how they do. Uh, but yes, Caitlin wearing the evidence. <laughs> Piece of cake. Okay. Uh, <coughs> folks, if you saw last week, uh, we did it on artifacts. Everybody was given an artifact, including Kyle. He got some stupid ass cauldron. Uh, thank you, Pinterest, for giving me the dullest mundane objects in the medieval world that you possibly could. Uh, tonight, we're going to go ahead and discuss lore. Oh, what's it good for? Uh, absolutely nothing, but we'll see what these guys have come up with. So first, let's go ahead and discuss what their artifact was, what it does, and what's the lore behind it. Uh, Joe is the new guy. Joe gets to start. Joe, what did you get as your artifact? My artifact was a spoon. Thanks, nice. Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pinterest. Um, it is, uh, I've labeled it the spoon of sustenance. Uh, it is a, uh, a simple silver spoon uh, engraved with celestial runes along the edges of it, uh, looking fairly uh, nice and regal uh, upon inspection. Then you notice that the runes themselves uh, have a fair bit of life to them. Uh, when used to uh, feed a creature soup or uh, some other type of liquid, uh, the user may speak the phrases written on the spoon to cast certain spells. Uh, for instance, the aid spell uh, to increase a uh, character's hit points by five uh, for the day. Uh, one character can only benefit from this once per day. Uh, the spoon then can cast Lesser Restoration three times a day, Death Ward once a day, and Greater Restoration once a day. Now, does it cast it only on the consumer or... Does the consumer only uh, on the consumer? The person, uh, the person who is being fed uh, from the spoon is gifted this reward. Essentially, how I imagined it is that um, you uh, you cook whatever with the spoon, and then you feed someone, and you can heal them of the poison, cure them of the blindness, uh, remove the curse that is uh, blighting them um, through through the use of this uh, magical spoon. Nice negative effects. Uh, not much because. <laughs> oh, come on, Joe. <laughs> Negative effects. Uh, well, if you uh, let's say if you use it too often. Uh, so if you try and use these abilities 
past their uh, limit, so to speak, then uh, it will, tw actually that works with the lore, uh, it will twist the, whatever the current condition that you're attempting to remove into a more severe version of itself. Nice, we like that idea. Uh, what is the lore behind the Spoon of Sustenance? Uh, so, a bitter argument between a devil and an angel pitched a war over the soul of a poor human in the winter wastelands of the north. The angel walked the earth and discovered a woman living alone in a cabin, warmed by her resilience in the frozen tundra. The devil, tailing this angel, placed a curse upon this human, uh, taking the uh, resilience and her hardiness away, ensuring that she would forever remain sick. So the celestial who fell in love with this woman crafted this spoon uh, to continuously heal her of these ailments to ensure that she would live a longer and happier life. Unfortunately, the celestial could not be there all the time. And in a effort to purge herself of this sickness, the woman tried to use the greater restoration too many times and fell deathly ill and passed from this world. I feel it's wrong to laugh, but I can't help that. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. I like that. Uh, was it Zeus? Was he the celestial? Because he was out. Um, you know, uh, I, I felt like the, the Zeus, Zeus would be, uh, he's not nice enough to create that kind of uh, soft spoon. I, I left the a uh, particular pantheon uh, up to interpretation because I wasn't sure if we're going to be in a particular world or not with this artifact. Nope. Why? Wise choice, though, because it does allow uh, others to use it. So good call. I like that. Spoon of sustenance. Uh, we started with David. We'll go with Carol. Carol, what, what was yours? All right. Well, I did set this in my world, um, but you can easily change religions and <laughs> I mean, it's already hard. It's all right. I've been playing with the name. I had Chalice of Heroes, I had Chalice of Healing. Um, and now I have the Chalice of Tricasta's Life. And the Tricasta is, it's a religion in the very, celebrated by this kingdom in the very southern part of my world, of my continent. Um, and the description was, it's a beautiful cut crystal chalice with an ornate design etched within, uh, etched within of the symbol of the great Tricaster, a trio of deities which are worshiped in the kingdom of Southex. When light passes through it, the chalice, it is always a golden hue, no matter what color it started out as. Um, but otherwise it doesn't glow, it doesn't, you know, it looks like a very pretty crystal chalice. There's also the phrase, Sugero Magna Mater, El Creator, Omnium Spiritus, I actually came over the Latin. <laughs> uh, basically, it says, creator, mother, creator, and all seeing spirit return ah. thy spirit of life to this being. And it's etched into the opposite side of the symbol. Um, the minor power was anyone who drinks from this chalice directs uh, benefits from the spell Hero's Feast. The major powers, though, and so obviously I touched on this last week, uh, if a single... Uh, person is fed and they're dead because that's not what a married person was that not a married person no just you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see there uh while the ink can't etched on that side that in latin is prayed uh they are brought back to life with full health and vigor if the chalice is raised upon high and the ink can't of course is uh, prayed any who have died within a 40 foot radius of the chalice will be resurrected to half health. The effect is considered to be a true resurrection spell in every aspect of then how much health you get back. But you're basically just brought back. Uh, with how no is that everybody? Everybody Friends in and a foes? 40 foot radius at half health. Radius. So it, friends, friends or foes? Friends or foes, yeah. Okay. Just gotta be very see. careful. Yeah, you gotta be exactly. <laughs> <laughs> See, but you can be very careful using this thing because it's got some pretty major drawbacks and the lore will get into the reason why it has these major drawbacks too much use of the cup is addicting for both the beneficiaries and the wielder 
After 10 uses of the minor power, which is the hero's beast, or two of the major, which is being resurrected or resurrecting someone, the individual begins to feel possessive of the chalice, wanting to keep its power for themselves. Wisdom <laughs> say C18 to stave off this effect, but upon failure, the person feels, we'll start with the first effect, an increasing need to drink from the chalice. After three failed saves, the need is so overwhelming, the person must drink from it once a day or fall unconscious and will remain so for a length of time equal to the first day. So like, let's say you started drinking and you drank for 10 days straight, you'd have to go for 10 days plus a fortnight. So 10 days plus oh, two weeks. Fuck. Yep, it's meant to really, yeah, well, you'll see why. Um, and a wish or a miracle, of course, can break this effect. Uh, the other effect, of course, is the increasing greed and possessiveness that you feel. You want this chalice for yourself and you want its power for yourself. After the first fail save, the victim of that failed save will start thinking and feeling like the chalice should belong to them. After a week of this, should they be still conscious at that point? The victim will desire the chalice so much they'll resort to anything, and I mean anything, to get it, including turning your alignment chaotic evil. Like Rania, <laughs> anything? <laughs> no, Rania had Rania's not evil, so she, you know, you know, and she doesn't tend to murder her allies. Um, <laughs> Ten. Uh, hey, wait, wait. Ten. Train. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't. Was that the, that wasn't Rainia? That was uh, that was, it was your Mar character, and I don't care because I'm <laughs> not Rainia. I get even with you. Oh no, she did not. Hold on, let me get through this. All right, so basically, you're so obsessed, you can't think of anything else until you get pos possession of it. If you have possession of it, then you can function normally. But to break, bad? what's that? Do you feel bad? What's the name of uh, this show? Uh, no, <laughs> you want it that bad. You really want it so badly that you cannot think of anything else. To break this obsession, the victim must be kept away from the cup for the same amount of time that has passed since they first drank from it, minus the two other two weeks. If they possess a challenge, they can function normally. Um, so here's the dealio. I assume you want the lore portion? Yep. About 1,500 years ago, in the kingdom of Southwicks, the kingdom was more of a collection of city-states rather than the unified kingdom it is today. One of the warlords, always looking for an advantage in the ongoing war, prayed to the holy Tricaster for something to give him the edge, giving them sacrifices and offerings. The answer came in the form of the chalice, which in reality had been sent by a demon. And we all, something we all know about demons is they're very chaotic and they love sowing chaos. Uh, his name has been lost over the ages. Uh, you know, that would be something. Steve. I, it's Steve, right? It, uh, Steve. <laughs> at first, the tides of war, of course, so he, he, so he got this. So at first, the tides of war had definitely turned in his favor as he was constantly bringing back his men, not realizing there was this side effect, <laughs> not realizing the true source of who answered his prayers. Um, so as he could, bring men, he could bring men back from the dead to carry on the fight. However, about a month later, his men... It had been starting, but about a month later, the, everybody started turning on each other and on him as their all greed over this chalice began to take over. In less than two months, the warlord and the entire army were gone, completely gone. Uh, the chalice was recovered. Okay. The chalice was covered by, uh, so once again, you can put this in your game. You just have to change the names. It's all make it for your campaign. Uh, seized by the Templars of the Creator, who have kept it under their watchful eye since then and under lock and key. Only three of the Templars ever know of its whereabouts. Uh, let's see, uh, three of the most high ranking and most trustworthy order that they know that when they are chosen, they know, <clears throat> they know that they're not going to, you know, try drinking from it. Um, and in reality, that third, basically what happens is one of the Templars dies. The other two pick the next one. So that way the name stays in the, those three people. So their names are not even known by anyone else other than Steve. the three. It's Steve. Sorry, oh, Steve. <laughs> I have succeeded over the year at keeping this thing hidden and it's something. 
but no one knows where it is. They have buried it pretty deep. So that is mine. And who knows, maybe I'll write something about it and stick it in my campaign world and maybe I'll run. I don't know. It's, it's pretty, it was very um, fun to do. This was a lot of fun to do and totally. very, I don't want to say it's, it's not inspiring. I uh, can't think of the term. But challenging. No, we I, like to challenge each other. It actually wasn't, you know, I wrote it this afternoon in about a half hour, so it wasn't too bad. Before you started drinking heavily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink. So yeah, me neither. Good. Me neither, Carol. Uh, David or Joe, you got any questions for Carol's uh, concoction? Uh, uh, no, I had Joe? <laughs> no, I mean it was pretty, pretty, pretty thorough. I guess the when I asked uh, if they felt bad, so like there's the you know they 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 want to do anything that they can to get this chalice. Once they get it, though, you said then they're back to normal. after they fix. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Actually, they would come to think okay. of it because yeah, that now that they have it, you know, yeah. all those emotions kind of go away. Mm -hmm. But if they ever okay. lose it again, they just yeah. come right. So yeah. it's. I feel, that's definitely uh that's definitely like a a, a high level uh, a high tier uh, yep. magic item that's like it's a whole it's a, a kind of like a, its own campaign arc I feel oh, like in trying to get rid of this thing once you discover yep. this terrible drawback oh it's totally it, it that's exactly what it is it's it's an entire campaign I like when I come up with artifacts I like to make it so that you can basically write a campaign around them. I like major things with major drawbacks and, uh, you know, and have major effects in the world. So that's, that's tend to how I roll. You don't have to, I mean, you're, yours is, yours is, yours is good too. Actually. I thought that was a really cool artifact. Um, oh, thank you. And you just proved that you don't have to have like this huge earth shaking world changing it can mm -hmm. be a lot smaller and have still have great effect and great um, use in your campaign. Kind of like what Dewey or Dewey Kyle What's pointed that? out last uh, last week. Kyle pointed out that the uh, ring from Lord of the Rings was pretty much a very simple yeah. item. I refer to it as a piece of crap, but uh, but then you built the entire campaign around it. So yeah, uh, like in both of it, David, I'm, disappointment. I'm going to do my what best, man. <laughs> I, my yeah, mundane no, it item do was a jug. It's right? a jug, folks. It's not only <laughs> Thanks, just- Thanks, Pinterest. <laughs> it's not just a container. It's a musical instrument. No. A little <laughs> oh, oh, I'm liking this idea. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That is not how I heard it. Jug. But I, a bar I'm that plays jug the jug. Oh my god! Um, totally. Right, let's, yeah. let's hear it though. What's the real thing? What's the real okay. deal? Okay. The real thing is it is it is called the font of Oceana, and basically what it is, it when it first appeared, it looked at, at like a simple plain clay ju uh, jug, but uh, over time. And because of circumstances and uh, the history of the item itself, it is actually uh, has writing on the around it that uh, is written in primordial. Uh, basically, this item has several spells uh, connected to it, and that can all be linked to a water theme. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, create or destroy water. Uh, the other is conjure elementals. Um, nice. With its restorative properties or cleansing property, uh, it has uh, the capability of healing. Uh, it also has the capability for uh, cleansing, which the poison condition, and it also has the ability for restoration. And like the legendary, uh, uh, that is the legendary effect of it is that it not only can help restore things, but it can even go to greater restoration. Not only could it restore uh, missing appendages or anything like that by drinking from this font, it can also uh, restore youth, uh, specifically youth that has been taken away from you due to a magical mm. uh, affliction uh, or something uh, like, like that. Yeah, so, 
It, but if this item is misused, it can it it can also uh, just yeah you'll suffer some wrath <laughs> from the goddess Oceana. So, what's the lore behind it? Okay, the lore behind it is that the pantheon of gods were pretty vain. They believed that the source of their power was worship, and they wanted to test the uh, fidelity of their worshipers. So basically the Pantheon got together and decided <laughs> to give this test to the realm of man. And they focused on one particular mortal. And basically they had given this mortal um, several trials. And basically what they were were trial, trials of faith. He lost his crops. He, lost, he was a simple farmer, lost his crops, lost his, his livestock, drought uh, plagued the village that he was in. He ended up also losing a child. So in desperation, he tried praying to each of the gods uh, in the Pantheon. And uh, they still didn't think that was enough uh, to, to prove his, his worship. Finally, one, one of the gods, gods in the pantheon, a goddess by the name of Oceana, said, this is enough. He, is, he has shown us his fidelity, and, it's just, and she decided to intervene. And with that, she placed a simple clay jug out in, out in the waste near his village for him to find, and he finds it. On the inside of the jug was sand. He pours the jug out, um, and of course, as the sand was uh, being purged from the jug, water started to flow. It started to flow so much, it just continued. Uh, it was fresh water. Uh, next thing you know, I mean, in addition to the sustenance that it provided for him and his family and the villagers, I mean, he would, with this, he found that he was able to irrigate, it, irrigate his crops. He was able to, you know, uh, able to dig a hole and actually create an aquifer and produce a well for the entire village. So this, um, the simple former realized uh, which God had intervened and started praying uh, devoutly to this particular goddess. He gave up everything and became a cleric. Uh, with that, the prayer that he used the very first time to pray to Oceana is emblazoned within the, the sides of the, the jug, written in primordial. And um, basically, uh, anyone who has this jug and can read primordial and recite this prayer to Oceana, these effects will, will take place. Now, what the lore behind it is that word got out about this cleric, about this, this artifact that he had. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, jealous and vain rulers uh, wanted to seek out this, this artifact, either to restore their youth or, you know, potentially use it as a weapon. And, uh, you know, a war actually broke out over this particular item. Uh, the, the civilization that actually captured and took the, the item for uh, selfish reasons, uh, you know, whether it was to restore emperor's youth or to use it as a device or any, anything like that for, for the purposes of war, uh, incurred Oceana's wrath and uh, elementals actually started to flow from the the jug itself and just lay waste uh, to the civilization that had it. So supposedly according to legend and lore that the jug is actually lost. It's either at the bottom of an ancient lake or at the bottom of the ocean, supposedly guarded by an ancient creature, either a leviathan or an abolith. And only those that are, you know, uh, devoted to Oceana that undertake this quest that may get clues to where this thing is 
have to pass the test of besting the creature to get the the jug. But anyway, since the jug is lost and the worshipers of um, Oceana are called diviners, their clerics actually roam the arid arid waste, uh, searching for water uh, to for villages and things like that. Thus, the term water diviner, and that's that's how it's all started. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll that's see. what I came up with, folks. So, that works. Uh, Carol, Joe, you got uh, questions for him? No, yeah, no, that was pretty well fleshed out. Although I kept thinking, so when is this farmer going to end up in the belly of a whale? Yeah, because I mean. <laughs> really felt like you know the trials of job yeah then that that's what kind of inspired it uh the trials of job but also um the movie the water diviner with uh russell crowe so nice yeah Um, well developed so yeah that's super interesting um uh jug i like the i like all the different mechanics that you can draw from a uh from a a water goddess uh that you know the, all the healing restorative properties all that but also the vengeance of the ocean is also uh, imparted in there as well um i guess uh in in terms of the drawbacks it's that if you are uh a non-devotee uh and you are attempting to use this jug it will just respond by like spawning a water elemental to drown you uh, kind of pretty much yes yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Also, the inspiration from this is being from New Orleans, man, during the time of Katrina. And uh, oh, you know. as soon as I knew, as soon as you started with it, I'm like, ah. well, also yeah. that get off Bourbon Street for God's sake. Exactly. But also that some <laughs> friends and I were talking. It's just like, dude, y'all, you know, I told him it was a jug, and it's just like, well somehow you should should mention something about the zoolander thing where with the beta <laughs> commercial you know nice. you know yeah. water is the essence of wetness you know yeah. some crap like totally. that inscribed on the side of the jug yeah uh, I, I, sorry one quick thing this is mm-hmm. i really want to play i want you to write this up i want to play this game i want to friggin i want to friggin go and take the tests and try to find the item that would be totally. so- okay all That'd right. be a, that would be a super fun adventure. Yeah. All right. Go okay. ahead. All right. I'll see if I'll write it out. <laughs> uh, uh, also, it should be able to cast the tidal wave spell. Just a thought. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, you know, you didn't disappoint me, except for the fact you mentioned a bardic instrument right off the bat. I know. And then did it. And then didn't. And then didn't. Now, <laughs> no time, now, man. It just Bubba, Bubba the Bard's brown jug. Exactly. Nice. Oh, my God. It, it didn't <laughs> dawn on me until after the show, and I was just yes. like, oh, my God. And, and now, you know, is that a gelatinous bard? Is, is that, that what I just saw? No, no, it's a dice. It's That's actually... True. Oh, okay. But I, I saw it green actually, and like that. But. The D6 that was, it's been made into a bard. It's one of the. Oh, favorite. nice. It looked. It. And, it made, and they come with the dice. Okay. So, folks, there's three uh, artifact level items that you can go ahead and use in your campaign along with the lore. You've got the uh, Silver Spoon of Sustenance, the Chalice of Life, and the Font of Oceana. So, feel free to alter it, use it in your campaign. Let us know if you use it uh, because we're curious. We're just curious by nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, The scope of this show was on lore. So, there you've got the lore. Now, let's go ahead and start into the lightning rounds with campaign depth okay how much lore is too much lore uh joe uh i mean there are there's multiple schools of thought on that Uh, the idea of if you fully flesh out your your lore your backstory right you you complete create a completely unique pantheon you decide which gods hate which and who created what and you have this entire history let's say you write a 40 page history of your world when do the players when are they going to find that like i good uh, question like for my for myself i the the world that my players are in i have uh because i've been playing with it so long the the world has become more fleshed out the gods that the players worship 
have more detail than the than the gods that are in the background who are who have nothing to do with the campaign. I know the 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 nine primary gods. I know what their deals are, but I feel like um, you're you're doing yourself a disservice as a DM if you're spending hours upon hours upon hours of lore that your players are not going to interact with. That's kind of my my view of it. You should know what the players are going to. Yeah, if the players are going to be delving into an aspect of of lore, you should know that absolutely. But I I I'm a big proponent of trusting uh, trusting yourself and trusting the improv uh, for your own world uh, and being able to tr trust what com what comes out of that in the moment. And, and I like your point about how are they going to find this because uh, it. Is it A, commonly known? B, is it uncommonly known? C, is it random legend from the region? Or is it just deep-seated lore? I, I like that. Uh, that is a good explanation. Carol, lightning round. Uh, how much lore is too much? Uh, I'll go a little bit more. Um, when your players are sitting there with glazed expressions on their faces, clearly bored, that may be too much lore. Um, Although once I think you said it just, it, sometimes it depends on the person. Like, I don't like, I don't need a ton of war. I didn't need to know every last detail about what's in that room. But like uh, my friend DJ, he loves details. He loves lore. So, I mean, that may answer, that may, that, that uh, question may have multiple answers depending on who you ask. Um, so, I mean, I said, I don't like, like I love I love storytelling and such, but I don't want. I said I don't like it when it gets into so much detail that I start losing track of, of the main story. I just want another story. Um, and actually, to just to, to comment on what you said, because I think that's a, that's a great point to even think about in terms of this question. Um, when I when I was when I write stuff, I basically write out a necessity. What are the PCs going to get into this week? You know, or basically, what's my character getting into? And what do I need to develop to, you know, when I was basically writing, you know, Taryn's the book and building my world around her? Um, what do I need to develop? And basically, I just focus on that little microcosm of lore of what that particular, that fits the need. It fits the need, you know, what the players are going to find. Because you're right, you could sit there and you could develop everything in your world but that's that's first of all you may never start running if you develop everything <laughs> in your world before you before you start running and i think it's better you just you start with what like developing one city the city they're in and then when they move out then you develop where they're headed and you come up with bits and pieces and and uh you know you don't have to me you don't even have to develop the whole city just the landmarks and stuff that they're going to need so it's a very good point but as I said, when, if your players are starting to stare at you or fall asleep at the table, then you may be rambling on a bit too much. I, I got to disagree with you on that one, Carol. You're a horrible DM unless you write the Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh. <laughs> You've got to do that first. Oh. That is that's you gotta so you gotta write the trilogy before you that's right the yeah. game. <laughs> yeah and there's some there's something to be said about that as well though because i've i've played i've played a game where where the dm has very clearly has an int has like a millennia of history of the world right so every time a player has a question about something along the historical lines they have an answer and they know that like this god dealt with this stuff the followers and the believers of this set of this sect were doing this at the time and that is um that's fantastic and if that's the game you're running if that's the type of game that the players are interested in if they want that historical aspect they want to get that lore and you can give that to them power to you but once again as you said earlier in some cases how would they know it too you yeah. don't know all history my players and, like throwing oh. axes at spinning halflings oh, and that's, and, yeah. Like, yeah. That's by write what you need right what you need to get to the players so yeah. i'm realizing they're not going to know every detail about this god but they're going to know this this and this facts that are more common that's what i mean by write what you need 
and that it, it's true. No, I agree. Uh, David, uh, how much lore is too much lore? I think that depends on your your players, like There's your party, the because. <laughs> I mean, if they're the type of players that fixate on every little detail and stuff like that, you're not going to get anywhere if you get too much lore. They're going to be like, what does this mean? You know, and, you know, and I can see how that can be a problem. I mean, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But if you've got all this, you know, I mean, just really complex lore in between, then it's just going to make that journey a hell of a lot longer, you know. So, which may be a good thing, but not always, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's just, I don't know. That's just one thing that I think of, but like with right creating lore, I mean, I, I'm kind of starting writing and stuff like that. And I have an idea for a campaign. So it's just like, okay, where do I start? You know, do I want to start with, writing this lore of this, you know, this continent or, or this world. And I just didn't know where to begin. So, but one of the things that I told myself, why don't you just write a one shot first and, you know, build it right off of that. And DM it. Maybe DM it. Maybe DM it there so I can take a fucking break. You know, keep it simple, stupid. Start with that. (laughs) One, write one session at a time. Mm -hmm. Seriously, that's just advice for you getting started. Just focus on that first session and only what you need for that first session. Because if you go nuts, you said you may you may just keep writing, 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 and never get to that. Oh point. God, I am like pulling from everything. It's just like, okay, how do I want to keep this for D and D players? How do do I want to use an established pantheon? Do I want to use yeah. this or whatever? And how I'm gonna right how on. how am I gonna take known lore and incorporate it into my campaign and build lore off of that? You know, totally. so yeah, map nation <laughs> deities. Lore. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, number one use for lore. Okay. Uh, you can choose things like uh, an immersive environment. You can choose things like this is your goal. You can choose things like it's just entertaining. Number one use, in your opinion, for lore. Joe. Tough question, <laughs> but that's why I didn't write it down. <laughs> sure, so Fun. Okay, number number one use of lore, um, I think is for, for me. I I believe would be to uh, primarily giving uh, giving direction to powerful NPCs. Um, they're the ones who are more than likely steeped in the lore, uh, especially if the big bad is going to be some like an ancient dragon. Right, like they are, they are steeped in the lore of the world. They have hundreds upon hundreds of years of experience to draw from. They know, you know, when the when the great earthquake that sundered the 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 earth in twain happened. They were there. They were present. Um, um, so I would say, using uh, I primarily use lore to feed the big bad's goals and to give uh, direction for the larger centers. So for the cities that have built up with great walls, the lore behind them dictates why those walls are there and what the what the defenders of the wall are fighting against and what they intend to do. Good answer. I was there when floppy disks were actually floppy. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Carol, number one reason to use lore. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, reason to be it's the it's to me it's the explanation of why is everything in this campaign why is you know the deal about that but what's the deal about that building and its history and how does that tie into your campaign i think that's 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 mm, i said it is a really tough question because there's a lot of uses for lore um it drives your plots and so on and so forth but i think it gives things a reason why they're there, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why, it answers those questions. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a good solid story behind it, then things can fall apart real fast. Um, There's nothing like, you know, not having everything completely thought out and having your players tossing questions at you and poking holes in your plot. 
So said, uh, D thank you, DJ, because he, he will said he will absolutely do that um, because he really loves tea tail. And, you know, you need a really good saw lore to, to, to basically keep it going. Keep, it's the glue. To me, it's the glue that holds things together. Nice. I guess. So you speak of these players that follow <laughs> a congruent line and not just jabber off willy nilly are, i've always that see assuming, the breadcrumbs and follow yes, I, them. I assume that these were myths no, no. <laughs> these are no. not murder hobos are they <laughs> really not. Well, that is more my point but i don't say so i don't like tons of detail but i also do like to have that i well I said i how many times said i like to have my plots all kind of you know tied up in nice neat little packages and come together i like to have the lore I love That's it when great. the lore interconnects, I guess you could say. This, the, the things that seemingly unrelated are really all connected together. Connect the dots. Good call. Yeah. David, uh, not, use the lore. Not that I'm their corporate shill or anything like that, but I think Wizards of the Coast uh, has some good examples of how lore, uh, you know, how important lore is to a campaign and how to facilitate it. I mean... I mean, I'm going to bring it up, but I'm going to man mention something else first. Tomb of Annihilation with Vecna, you know, I mean, you had your big bad and, you know, all these other encounters in front of that. That wasn't the main thing, but there were there were other other aspects like the, the Ring of Winter and stuff like that. You know, that was all part of the story that leads you up to the tomb and then dealing with Vecna um, or the ire or uh, uh uh, what was a vision of that you now or something like that, depending on how your DM wants to play it. Uh, Curse of Strahd, you know, I mean, Gothic horror built off of basically Bram Stoker, you know, and, but I mean, one of the things that kept you going was Strahd's belief in reincarnation and Irina, you know? So, but that was the narrative. The point I'm trying to make, that's the narrative of the campaign. And, you know, you decide your play sessions i mean a good thing to do is you know follow the narrative you know that you have in your mind as a dm and use that to you know steer your players if if they're willing to play yeah, along yeah, you're, you're gonna have to dm murder hobos for once yeah. that i know that's a kind of why do you think i ass. don't want to man. <laughs> hey damn they, they actually stuck pretty good to what i had which was surprising yeah, they, but they did stick pretty well to it. But like I said, uh, use your lore as your narrative. That is, that that's that that would be my, you know, suggestion yeah. on what to do with it. Yeah, that works. Uh, personally, uh, my two cents: use lore to fill in the blanks when mm -hmm. they catch you off guard. Uh, oh well, uh, this crevice is from the uh, Battle of the Gods, in which the trident of unforgiving darkness uh, pierced the land, and uh, uh, most of the other details are uh, hidden within the <laughs> village, which we will discuss next week uh, after I have five minutes to write down my dumbass. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everybody's called Steve in my world. The reality world. Uh, is Steve. Frank doesn't wait, wait. write lore, actually. He just pulls it out of his ass and just writes it down. It it becomes lore. David, That's the thing. David. Once you say it out loud, it's canon. It's canon. David, that was the thing I was going to say to you. It's like, you know what the best thing about running your own world is? You make whatever shit up you want on the fly because it's your world and you yep. have a lot of facts probably bouncing around that, that you can mm -hmm. play off of and make up you can make up lore on the spot oh yeah what one thing i uh one thing i i've said multiple times uh and indeed with players yeah. backstories as well just because that's their own that's their own type of lore right mm -hmm. yes. um it's if it hasn't been said at the game table and it hasn't come into play it's not canon and can be changed yes that's, that's a good rule that is a good rule uh, we we do session zero if you write it down and you give it to yeah. me. Yeah, hundred percent. Right, Nocti. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. not, but Nocti was not a session zero, and in reality, so you <laughs> you came in late. <laughs> the only I mention is because I made her the character for the hand of Bane. Really, 
And that's that's it. Uh, no, I'm still I'm still really. I wish I had put her in that original backstory, but I was like, ah, I'm just going to take her back to her roots. I'm just going to give you the original backstory that I gave my original GM 30 years. <laughs> Well, spoiler alert, she's going to die this weekend, so I wouldn't put too much more. If you didn't see that coming, come back. then you haven't been yeah. paying attention. And, and <laughs> if you're paying attention, you know exactly how she's going to die. <laughs> uh, with lore, we could go on all night long. It is a fantastic topic. Uh, mm -hmm. We will revisit it at some point in time, especially when Scott is available. I know Scott loves his lore. Unfortunately, he chose his wife's birthday. Over Imagine us, that. Which is horseshit. <laughs> Scott. Uh, <laughs> thanks. We know where we stand, uh, but he will come back and uh, he will delve into uh, more again. Uh, we will revisit this topic. Uh, there's just too much to cover. So let's uh, move to final thoughts and uh, we'll get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, we're going to start with David, go to Carol, mm -hmm. and then end with Joe to give him last word. So David, okay. you got? final thoughts, use session zero to introduce your lore. I mean, take the time in session zero, tell the story and build, build your campaign from there. And, you know, hopefully it'll work. <laughs> so, <laughs> And if it doesn't, Steve, the deity will go ahead and take over. Exactly. Carol, final thoughts. Um, you know what? I, I like the whole thought of players' backstories are definitely war. Um, it's mm -hmm. their war. And you can really build off of their war. I mean, actually, I think, I think, I believe you said you built a lot in terms of what I gave you for backstory, even though it was so short. And, um, you know, consider that as part of your war in your campaign as well as what they supply. Absolutely. So. Very good. Joe, yeah. final thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> uh, bouncing off of those, those things, the uh, using session zero to give your players the agency to dictate their own backstory. That is a, that is a wrapped present for you as a DM where, where like they, they give you where they're coming from and you can build a campaign out of that. My most, my most recent campaign that started, every character had, uh, had a mystery that they were unaware of. So that <laughs> mystery is now tying all of them together that they're unaware of. But that that allowed me to springboard the the BBG for the for the game. So your, your lore, the lore that your players create is just as valuable as the lore that you create. Um, it's a shared storytelling experience. It's not just one person, and it gives them an investment in your game. Uh, ne never underestimate letting the players have their say and uh, i know carol's thrilled to no end and i know that kyle is deep within mourning of his mentor being found dead in the crypts but oh i love hurting kyle <laughs> yeah gotta give them knives give, gotta give the gm knives to you right. and both kyle and i certainly did i don't think the others did as much but um but i know we did and but that's because we I think Kyle and I are very similar. In fact, we love to have it. We love to have those knives hucked back at us. I'll just spit out whatever he's drinking tonight. Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, this has been Murder Hobo Inc. Between the Rolls. Uh, discussion on lore. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive if you want to buy our crap. Sorry, Carol. Not crap. Good stuff. <laughs> awesome i've got whatever uh it's down there uh, if you want to join us in discord it's down there most importantly if you want a seat like joe here or in the one shot m hobo inc twitter gmail let us know uh we think joe's going to be here next saturday for a game uh as is travis i believe um nice. so you know there's that leaves two more seats so you know uh and you've seen carol play you can't do any worse than that I mean, oh, yeah. uh if you want your own session with joe he does have uh you know narrow time frame because he's already running five campaigns but hit him up uh you know he can see what he can do uh join us thursday for cacophony as uh, maybe maybe not they get out of jail hard to say maybe somebody dies that's important maybe not I'm not sure. Yeah, the answer is probably yeah. Somebody's gonna freaking die. Uh, <laughs> hell, everybody's dying there, uh, folks. For all of us here at Murder Hobo Inc., thanks a lot. Have a great night and a great week. Come see us Thursday. Everybody, wave, say goodbye. Bye, goodbye, everybody.
Bye.